Good morning, everybody. Ice coffee time. Good morning. Good to see you. A little bit of a technical thing there. Completely me. Good to see you. I am here. Thank you for waiting a couple minutes for me. I knew I'd get there in the end. I'm getting better and better. A little bit more confident with pressing buttons. Let's see. Good to see everybody on this beautiful spring-like Tuesday. Are you having the same thing? It was so... Um, it was so exciting out, I decided I wanted to put on my Valentine earrings early. It's, I mean, it's almost like a spring day out there. I hope that you're getting something similar. We had a mixed bag yesterday, as always, because we're in such different places, aren't we? Mom, good to see you. Good morning in warm Granby. I know. It is so strange, isn't it? Um, I don't know if anybody follows uh, Farmer's Almanac, and I don't know a lot about it, but I'm so curious to see what they have to say on this subject of, well, I guess there's a reason why the pendulum keeps swinging so hugely. It's because there's not much of an ozone layer anymore. But uh, nonetheless, it is nice to have a bit of a reprieve from that terrible, bitter winter weather. Hope I didn't slurp. Uh, Barbara, good to see you. Aileen, good to see you. It not as cold as it has been Toronto. Yep, all of us today, I think, are getting a warm front. Is it a warm front? Becky, good to see you. Good morning from sunny Indiana. Can take the cold when the sun is shining. That's true. Those are true winter days, aren't they? When you get the uh, beautiful, bright, white winter sun um, and it's everything else is like bleak and, and uh, winter landscape. It is beautiful. It is a moment in time. Robin, good to see you. The, fun, the sun is finally out. Denise, the sun is finally out in Texas too, huh? High is 65 today. Oh, that is warm. Kirsten, good morning from snowy Vermont, but sunny still. Is it sunny there too? At least. Hi from Myrtle Beach. Hi, Penny. The sun is trying to come out. I think it's, I think it's going to make its way. It might be working downward. It might be working from Canada down this morning. Aileen, I'm really going to have to get better at the Fahrenheit to Celsius. I know I had the same thing when I lived abroad. Um, in England, it was all right, but then in I'm like continental Europe, you know, you had to make the switch, and it was always so confusing to me uh, what the temperature actually was. It was often t boiling terribly hot with no air conditioning. Nobody's heard of an air conditioner. Um, and when it was cold, it was horribly cold, and it seemed like the thermostat couldn't make its way up to normal temperatures even inside the house. But yeah, it is hard to translate, isn't it? I, I, I never got used to that after years and years. Tara, good to see you. Cindy, good to see you. Doreen, good to see you. Yeah, because 65 must sound crazy, right? <laughs> Doreen, good to see you. And Linda in Massachusetts. That's right, we're doing conversions here. It, it is super confusing, isn't it? It's, it? I wish it was just a nice even number that made sense. You could just do the math in your head real quick to show the difference. Joyce, good to see you in Pennsylvania. A gloomy day, but at least it's not freezing. There you go. Glass half full, right? Linda, good to see you. Cooking for your daughter who's recovering from you know what? Oh, gosh. Well, I'm, I'm glad that she is on the mend. We've had two scares um, in the last 24 hours in Jocelyn's class. So it's just like, it's just, it's just hard times, isn't it? Uh, definitely not out of the woods. But um, now they're not having the kids stay home and isolate when there's a scare in the immediate classroom. I don't mean in the school, I mean in the classroom. There was one yesterday and there was one today. So the only thing that I could do to kind of, um, my head just started hurting when I said that, the only thing I could do to counter that is like her, her little friend comes over three times a week and they kind of raise hell like upstairs with the, with the um, virtual reality machine and up in the bunk beds and stuff. So I said until we get like the definitive on um, testing and stuff, um, school is one thing because everybody is masked up and, and there are hopefully precautions in place, I hope. Um, but of course, there can't be all the time, can they? I mean, it's like a pipe dream or ridiculous to think that it's completely all uh, buttoned up. Of course, it's not because everybody is a human being and, and there's all kinds of margin for error. But at least at home, we don't have to have people in the house who don't need to be there. Isn't that awful? Isn't that awful? But I know that like, you know, at home, obviously, they're not wearing masks. They're like um, wrestling and stuff. So that wouldn't be the thing to do today. She's going to be disappointed, but that's all right. I think I'll... Um, do something else with her that keeps her a little bit happy. Um, Dave percolated and caffeinated and ready for coffee times. I like it. I am too. I need one more sip. I've had a rough morning. Not rough, just crazed, you know, just busy. 
Nancy, good to see you in Las Vegas. Yeah, you feel my pain, huh? It's like, I'm not going to start because it's so boring because we all know the story, right? But it's like I, sh I sh go to put the program on and I forget that the camera won't work unless I shut the program down and then plug the camera in. If I plug the camera in after the program's open, it won't work. Um, but it, I forget stupid things like this because so much of technology has to do with the chronology of what you do. So it's like it's not just knowing what to do. It's like doing it in the right order. And for me, that is so boring. It's hard to remember. I guess that's all it is, right? Carrie, good to see you. Good morning in cold and wet Tampa Bay, Florida. Oh, I'm so happy to see you. Uh, Cats Gallery, good to see you. Good morning in warm and sunny California. Mom. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so self-conscious about slurping now, but I, I want the coffee more than I want to worry about that. I wonder how much my mic is like hot, you know, like tuned right into what I'm saying for somebody to write a comment like that. Lisa, good to see you. I am having a good day. I hope everybody is having a good day too. And you, Lisa. And Linda Ann, good to see you. And Edmonton, Alberta, great to see you. Joy, great to see you. Good morning. So, you know, I took a little bit of a... Um, break yesterday from working on book stuff and working on other projects. And I just thought, you know, I want to put out a bunch of classes this month. I have been like absent friend for a while and I've been on coffee time, but I haven't been doing a lot. Haven't been doing a lot in person, of course, over the holidays. But um, it's all coming back now. And I wanted to offer more Zoom classes that were for beginners. I, even though it doesn't seem like I'm present on our Facebook group, which is Rug Cooking and Punch Needle Club, I am. I look often, Kirsten looks most of the time and does m most all of that. But once in a while I look and I see things and I try to um, gather information and get a feel for what people are looking for because I can see that our membership goes up hugely all the time. We're heading toward 9,000 now. So, you know, I know there's a lot of new people in there who would maybe like to take in a, a Zoom class, right, to just get going uh, because we know people learn in all different ways and, and me too. And it really depends on what it is because there are some things that I really still prefer to learn how to do out of a book where I can put it open on the table and put weights on it and just stare at pictures and try to follow along. And then there are some things that I prefer to learn to do like on a YouTube video, something like that. And then there are still things that I prefer to learn to do in person. So um, mostly things that I anticipate asking a lot of questions that I, I haven't been able to find answers for in the other ways. So, um, you know, so I, I want to try to be there a little bit more in the next couple months with running classes. And I thought yesterday, let me just put the brakes on, just hold time for a moment. And I worked out a design I was telling you about. Let me see if I can grab the design. This is the design I was um, drawing it uh, right before coffee time, and then I finished it right after. I wanted to do something really simple because I'm putting, I'm going to offer a class that is hooking with yarn. This is one of the things that comes up a lot. Um, so I wanted to do one that's specifically hooking with yarn. And sorry, I'm doing this with fiber tape. Um, and this class is also going to include a little bit of pantyhose, right? Like the nylon stockings. So hooking with yarn and nylon. So um, this one is not a strips class, wool strips class. But this is the design, the fiber tape just ripped it a little bit. But this is the design I drew out. Maybe it looks better this way because it's not as curved. It's just a very simple sort of Art Deco bunny in the sky with um, cotton ball type clouds over um, a little field of Easter eggs. So super easy. And I thought, yeah, let's do let's do yarn because on that Facebook group, there are constantly questions about hooking with yarn versus hooking with wool strips or anything else, right? So I started working on it yesterday. I, I took out some colors that I liked. I didn't want to go super predictable because I already have a bunny pattern from last year or the year before out with the big Easter hat that's like overturned. That's I think a 10 by 10 or a 12 by 12, a smaller one. Um, and th I love that one too. I still love that one. And then I have the carrot, the bunnies with the carrot in the middle, R carrot, I think it's called. So I wanted to do something different this time um, oh, good, because you have yarn. It's so much fun hooking with yarn, and I always recommend it to beginners. I know I say this all the time, but in case there's beginners listening for the first time, I always recommend hooking with yarn first because I feel like it at least, of all the problems that might come up when you're starting to hook, right, one of them, hooking with strips, is that it twists as it comes up. And this, I mean, this is from teaching in person that I have this experience of like, so often people saying, 
um, what's wrong with me? I can't make it work. I can't do this. This isn't for me. I keep twisting my strips. And I think of all of those little technical things that can happen that you know after the hot minute that you take and step back that it is a technical problem and it's not you and it doesn't mean you're not meant to do this. After all that, some people don't wait to get that far to figure that out and work that out, right? Some people just forget it, you know? So I, I try to create a situation where there's as few possible hurdles as possible. And one of those hurdles is flipping as you go. And of course, with yarn, that doesn't happen. There's nothing to flip because it's not like a flat ribbon. It's like a cylindrical piece of yarn, right? So there's no flipping involved. So for that reason, I just feel like at least for people who are true beginners, when you get going with yarn, even if it turns out not to be your favorite thing to hook with or punch with, um, it might be that at least you get some traction going and some confidence going um, before you start tackling other things that do have a, a little bit more of a play factor, right, to, pl to play you. So I took out some of my yarns and I wanted to go with some different colors. So I took out a, the light's probably not good, but a very sort of hubba bubba pink, um, pink, a very light green. It's a bit of a, um, um, it looks yellow in the monitor, I can tell, but it's like a, it's like a, like a lime soda with ice cream. Have you ever had one of those where they put a scoop of vanilla into like a lime, like a lime ricky? It's that kind of thing. Super, super, super pale, little hint of green, and then a very, very, very soft peach um, that's got a little more color than like a straight peach, a little bit more toward orange, but very light, the value of a very light peach. And then for the yellow, I'll show you the piece itself. Sorry, for the um, white, for the body, I didn't want to go just an all white body because I thought Ben there done that wore the t-shirt. So instead I used, you probably can't see this either, but this is a um, yarn that has many colors in it, right? So there's pastel, yellow, green, pink, and a little bit of orange, very, very soft. And I started hooking it um, last night and I just worked on it for a little while. I go pretty fast, so don't go, oh, I, I would never get that done because you would get this done. And this is yarn and I feel like it goes fast. But here he is already, right? And this is the way the colors are working out. And so far I like them. I'm realizing this cloud looks too square. I'm gonna fix that. But I have them outlined in gray and you probably can't see, but the body is quite, now you can't see. I'll take a photo and put it in the Facebook group. Colorful. Um, this is that grass. Let me change the light on this thing. Hang on. This is what these things are for, right? I got a piece of technology in my hand right now. Now, any of those better? No. Oh, it would might be good for a baby's room. Let's try. Nah. It's playing me. Well, I'll take a picture of it later, but it's you could, it's very, very subtle. Um, in daylight, it's beautiful. I gave him a little bit of a red eye. You know how bunnies sometimes have that little... I gave it maroon because I was thinking dark, light, dull, bright. I had no darks. So here's my dark. Um, but, you know, I've got the orange sky and I'm dropping in the pink clouds. And I'm doing on the eggs, if you can see this, this will be in the kits that go out for people who want this class. These are pantyhose, right? These are nylons. So with the nylons, you get, um, with most of them, you get the two parts, right? Like the control part that goes here that's like super tight and opaque, and then the bottom is sheer. So if you can see with these, let me see if I can come in. Yeah, you can see some of them are, the fuzzy wuzzies are like the sheer part, right? This one here, was more, I have more opaques in there, if you can see the texture, but in the middle I have some of the sheer, it's the same stocking. Um, but I've got my Easter eggs going and I'm dyeing them with um, PAS, P-A-A-S, right? Like the Easter sets, those tablets that come in the Easter sets, um, because you can use those. Those are essentially tablets of food coloring. And look out for them this year. I hoarded some last year at the end of the season because they were like 90% off at the end of the season. But look out for those because they're fun to dye with. They're not toxic. Um, and there are different packs, right? Not just the Paz brand, but also on Amazon, like there's a neon pack. Sometimes there's different packs like just superheroes or just dinosaurs or something. And I buy those too because they have different colors in them. And they're not regular color. I mean, they're not the colors from food coloring. They've already been mixed and um, formulated in a way that makes it a different color. So I buy as many different packs as I can. Uh, particularly after the season, and then I dye with them, things like this, but I thought it made a lot of sense to dye, and I'm going to do a bunch more. This this is the same stocking, this one and this one, uh, kind of rainbow, but it's really hard to tell. 
and then I did one purple stocking that's all I had the time for so far but this kit is going to include the pattern this is rug warp I think I'm going to put it on monk's cloth um, we'll see I might stick with rug warp rug warp is great to hook with yarn because it's tight it's even tighter than monk's cloth so it really holds it really holds and this is all yarn that I dyed um, three ply Briggs and Little you know I get my yarn at the Maritime family um, nice family company and they do a beautiful job and I and I dye it all so I've dyed all this and I've even dyed all the eggs I'll probably put in I would say seven eight nine colors uh, of stockings right all different ones to hook the eggs because this whole thing is going to be different colors and I also chose to hook the tail with stockings right a little bit of rainbow stocking again to kind of echo the field and I'm going to see how it goes because until the field is fleshed out with all these different color eggs in it I might make changes yet again but right now I kind of like it my only real whites are in the background of the tail and will be in some of the eggs so I'll see how it goes I, I never really know for sure about the colors until it's done and I might not finish this completely because I want to work on it in class but this will be coming up soon this is going to be called Cottontail Lane mom after that street on Cape Cod that remember um, so it's real it's real pretty it's much prettier than it looks in there yeah and you know these are some of the stockings like this is the purple one and how i cut up you know this is the control top part right so i already cut some of it off but you can see this is real opaque as opposed to this part uh, which still hooks really well it's almost like transparent you know it has this fragility because it's so sheer um, and I think it's really beautiful to hook with. If you're wondering how do you hook with pantyhose, well, you just cut them with a pair of scissors, right? In this case, I was cutting them like this into little loops as if they, I was going to do one of those weaving loom things, right, from back in the day, the nylon loops or the cotton loops. Um, I cut them, I'm lazy, so I cut them like this. And then I typically, because it's such a small area too, the eggs where I was working, I cut them like this and then um, I hook them double, like I keep it as a loop and I just pull it up in the middle and hook it till it gets to the end. I only get three, four, five loops out of it. You could also cut it this way, but that's going to take some time to kind of undo it and get, you know, a good line going up. I'm happy just going like this, this, this all the way down, you know. So that worked great. And then this is the other, um, no, I didn't use that stocking actually. This is one of the other stockings I used. You probably can't see the colors again, but they're really nice soft colors on the top and then some really light colors underneath so this has been this has been a fun little diversion way of getting away from other work projects i guess right i'm so i'm so naughty that's true linda and uh, variegated colors are so much fun it's like you know this if you are already a knitter Th those moments of pulling up a loop and getting a different color if you remember if, from being a knitter, if you have been like, I remember sitting in bed so late at night and just waiting for that color change to come out of that skein, falling asleep like this while I'm, you know, and, and it just taking forever to get a color change. And now with hooking, I really enjoy hooking with variegated or multicolored color changing yarns and wools because it's constant, constant satisfaction of seeing other colors pop up. And it's so much fun. So that'll be coming up, um, <laughs> Doreen, that'll be coming up soon. Linda Ann says also, um, you use 95% wool. Um, absolutely. Um, wool yarn. Are you saying wool yarn? I lost that comment now. I'll have to come back to that. I missed a bit. So my mom said that uh, would be a great hanging for a babe, for a babe's room. Absolutely. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be, well, it does have to be Easter, doesn't it? Because there's, there's eggs in it. I started with a basket design, and I was like, nah, I'm all basketed out. I'm good for now. But, um, yeah, I like having the eggs on the ground because it created what we call in composition class a scatter pattern, right? It's not really scattered, right? They're, they're pretty evenly placed to get the maximum folk art effect. But um, it's fun, and it's going to be easy to hook, and it's fast to hook. I think it's a great beginner pattern. So I'm hoping that people are interested in that. Love those yarns. Match my shirt. Thank you. This shirt um, reminds me of those. What are those the licorices? The Are those all sorts? The, the British licorices that come in all these colors, right? You know what I mean? I got, this, um, I got this at Goodwill or something just because it had those colors. And I love that kind of licorice, <laughs> Kirsten. So I'm just catching up on your, oh, Dave says, Lame Ricky used to be a diner in Toronto by that name. Oh, no, it's gone. Dang it, huh? There are still so many places around here, um, in, in a lot of places. One of my 
that have like the old time soda fountain where you could get a lime ricky or a phosphate or something like that. And um, one of the best ones is in Philadelphia. I think it's called the Franklin Fountain, something like that. But there's there's a bunch of them around, and they are still so much fun to go to. That was that was Dad's first job, right, Mom? Being a, being a soda jerk, or was it being a lamplighter? It was one or the other. Two really wacky, old timey jobs. Oh, good. So anyway, so that came up. I finished with that. I was just catching up on the comments, um, and I wanted to remind you. I put up the class for this month, which is designing like Pearl McGowan. And I expect to get out of that for each person to get a bunch of, uh, as you would expect, very traditional designs, but also a bunch of very different designs pulling from her travel experience and her very diverse interests. Um, so, you know, she spent a good amount of time, decades, documenting antique rugs that she encountered, just like Ralph Burnham, right? Really shoring up that history. So her earlier designs are very traditional and pull from those early antique rugs. But as time went on, as with anybody else, right, as time went on, you become interested by art and popular culture and the things that are around you, and her tastes changed and her interests changed. So we'll not just cover her very traditional uh, designs that now really are associated with Pearl McGowan. We'll also look at her other work that changed as she changed, as she grew older and became um, interested in different things. So I think it's important to represent the entire timeline of her work and not just what we now think of as a promagown design because there were so many of them. Because she transposed so many antique designs early in her career in those first 20, 30 years, right? That's not really early. But during those you know, first 30 years, she was really documenting a lot. Um, and because of that, a, a lot was produced, right? And then when she was designing her own things, it slowed down a bit. So she was putting out less. So in terms of output, the most output we see are those very traditional designs. But it doesn't mean that the later ones um, that she did after that, sort of the floodgates opened on all the antique rug designs, the ones that came later are just as important and represent a different time in her life. So I'm looking forward to that. And I'm looking forward to researching it and getting started on the content. Carrie says, I've done a couple of bumblebees. And nah, I'm good for now. A couple of bumblebees. Are you talking about the yarn? A couple of bumblebees. I've done a couple of bumblebees. I feel like I missed something. Did I miss something good? I probably did. Oh, darn. Um, or maybe that was a promo gown comment. But that's coming up. And also, I'm teaching in person. I think I told you. I'll have to post it somewhere, maybe on the website, um, making the Amish um, toothbrush rugs. Uh, the last weekend of March, right before we go see Claire Mari, that got pushed back because one of her locations is change is changing, closing uh, because of the pr the property, not because of her, because of like things happening, things being for sale. So that's causing a bit of upset at the moment. But we're going to go later in March, and I'll be teaching that weekend too, and then teaching in Madison the penny rug. So those two different forms of rug making are coming up. Me teaching in person, but our Zoom class, the design class, that's over Zoom. And um, so is the bunny class. Unless you're near me and you want to come to the studio and work in person, you're always welcome to do that for my classes. I'll be Zooming, but you can be sitting next to me. So that's always possible if, if you're near me. I'm outside New Haven, Connecticut, and you're always welcome. Oh, thanks, Linda Ann. The design light classes are informative. I hope so. They, they should be informative and fun and all that. Talking about baskets. Oh, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. There, sometimes there's enough, at least for the moment, right? I know what you mean. I'm all basketed out for the moment, and it's a shame because Easter is just around the, well, it's not, is it? It's not around the corner. It's, what, April? All right, careful sip. So, you know, I want to return to what we were talking about yesterday because I, I went down the rabbit hole a little with applique, and I was introducing you, just beginning to look at this book called Textiles Transformed by Mandy Patulo, and she's got... Um, another book that's called Textile Collage. The links to both of these should be in this video. These are both great books. This book is the beginning. It is, a, is about how to do collage. She's working from old fibers, right? She's working from old quilts, um, old cut up things that have damage, old clothing, any kind of textile um, that's old, right? That's quite old. And she's showing us how to choose, how to break them down, how to deconstruct or decompose, and ideas for putting them back together in interesting ways that have a collage look, like a textile collage look. So the first half of the book, she's talking about that. And in the second half of the book, she talks specifically about wool applique. And it's not the kind of wool applique that touches on 
um, penny rugs and things like that. We're going to come to it, but it's basically doing the same thing with very mixed multimedia textile collage, but on a wool base and like using wool threads and yarns, so using a lot more wool. So that's the second half of this book. I haven't gotten her other book, which is called Textile Collage yet, so I'm hoping I'll probably order that soon. I was seeing how much I like this book, and so far I like it very much. I think it's a really, really good inspiration book for people who, um, even if you are a rug hooker exclusively, I don't want to say just a rug hooker, but exclusively a rug hooker, you can get a lot of ideas from the way she puts compositions together uh, because she does a lot of things that touch on primitive too. So there's a lot of crossover for us in this book, but particularly for people who think you might have it in you in the future to think about using different materials on your rug pieces, right? And the word rug is so problematic in itself, and it always has been, hasn't it? Because most of us are not making rugs for the floor, but that pesky word rug persists, and it's hard to get rid of it. We're going to have to really push if we want to overwrite it at some point. Um, but your textile piece or your fiber art might at some point include hooking, like rug hooking or punching, and some other additions. So for example, some of the ideas that she puts forward to us in this book. So I'm going to share screen, <laughs> me and my baskets, I'm going to share screen for just a minute. And let's see where we, I want to, I want to start with the picture that we, there we go, um, that I used for the thumbnail today and that we left off with yesterday. So hopefully you can see that okay. I can stretch it a little bit more. Um, this is nice because it really touches on a primitive house composition that we would see quite often in rug hooking. And you can see very similar to rug hooking um, that she has, oh, April, good to see you that she has blocked out the background the way that rug hookers do. Now you can see that she's blocked it out with fabric, uh, some of which has been reversed. So we're not looking at the front of it at all. We're looking at the back of it, which is an interesting choice because you could do that in many scenarios. Number one, if um, the front is damaged and for some reason the back is not. Number two, if the fiber, if the textile is new and you wish it was old, like for example, it's one of those um, contemporary 1860s Civil War era cottons and you wish it looked a bit more faded, well, flipping it over could really help, right? It, it gives it maybe more of the look you want. So just experimenting with fabric, pulling some, you, in this piece, pulling some lace off of some other stuff or maybe some finding some new old stock. You can see under the house in place of the lawn or the sort of picket fence, she put just a row of zigzag, right? So that's something that came off a quilt. Um, I'm sure, you know, many of us, and, and I know that we're lucky when we do, but I know many of us find old quilts and stuff in antique stores, yard sales, you know, whatever. Other people live in more rural areas, and it's more of a push to try to find uh, anything exciting in terms of supplies, new or old. But um, if you are lucky enough to be in a place where you often find old stuff, and it's often junked out and destroyed to the point of um, seeming hopeless, um, when you look at an image like this, it really makes you think about what hopeless is, because you could even take tiny strips of something that is really shot and still make them useful and beautiful. Each thing, hi crafters grimoire, each thing has um, a place, right? And I like that we, we covered this in our MCM designing like mid-century modern class this week. I like the way that she has put those round single flowers down. She's pulled it out of the larger uh, fabric, right? Like the floral fabric on the right. She's pulled those elements out and she's kind of pinwheeled out around them. This is something we talked about in class. Instead of um, cutting around each uh, little petal, right, like very literal, she's pinwheeled out. She's shaped out circles around them, and it creates a lot more interest. I think the house itself might be uh, cross-stitched, and I don't know how much of each of these pieces she's doing original uh, stitching, because I know that she is a very uh, fine needlewoman, needlepoint, cross-stitch, any kind of needlework, anything with a needle in her hand. And if you are too, you can see the possibilities of being able to add here and there motifs that you really like onto something that you are piecing together from old bits as you go. I think this is just a good idea. In this, I'm going to come out of this one for a minute. Let me close that and come back to you just for a minute. 
in this first chapter, there I am. She taught, it's called, this is such a different book, right? This is so different. The first proper chapter is called Turning Over. And she's talking about sometimes the patchwork quilt surface may be too bright or patterned and fight against the ideas that you have for it. This is particularly the case with crazy quilts. Uh, these quilts were made in Victorian times out of scraps of velvet and silk, damask, and were intended to be eye-catching and opulent. They were often embroidered with motifs like flowers or animals, and the border of each pattern or patch might be emphasized with a herringbone stitch or a feather stitch. I do not like many crazy quilts I have seen, but I do like the back of one that I have used here in the Red House. The quilt was constructed on a base of fabric and turned over to reveal the patchwork of patterned fabrics with traces and shadows of stitches that embellished it. Oh, interesting. So what we were just looking at is actually the reverse of a crazy quilt. That's interesting. Let's look at that house again just to see. It does make me wonder what the crazy quilt looked like. Okay, well, that makes a lot of sense. That explains that reversed fabric, right? It fell into the first category. She just didn't like it. Now, this is interesting because this idea of doing, um, reversing things, I'm going to come back to you. This idea of reversing things is a neat idea. I, I don't know that I would have the heart to reverse a Victorian crazy quilt, quilt. Although the thing is, sometimes you find patches of old quilts or old quilts that are sold as uh, Victorian and they're clearly not, right? There's so many synthetics in there, you can immediately see that's not satin, that's poly. Um, this is what I'm probably holding is a 60s, 70s, or even 1980s era quilt, which is fine, right? Because sometimes the people who are selling just don't know what they're holding. Um, and they are very liberal with their use of words when they're selling. But sometimes you find that, and I more often find quilts that I pass on uh, crazy quilts, log cabin quilts, whatever, that are more 1960s, 1970s era. And I often pass on those because I don't like the colors. Um, or that there's something, or if they're using prints, if they're not solids, if they're using prints, maybe for me they're a bit too calico. But not the 80s calico that I'm in love with that's all dusty rose and Wedgwood blue. The other calico that's always like bright, bright orange, brown, and Kelly green. Do you know what I mean? So it's just a taste thing, right? That's someone else's taste. That's my personal taste. Um, I like a little bit later or a little bit earlier. But in that case, now I'm going to be thinking, because I have some of those, now I'm going to be thinking, interesting, if I turned some of those quilts over, is what I'm looking at in reverse something I'd be more inclined to use as, as a backing? or foundation for adding more things to. That is a really interesting thought. So this chapter, Turning Over, uh, is just one of many ideas in this book that's like, just think about it, think about it, think about the possible uses for this. Carrie says, my mom made a crazy quilt. It weighed a ton and was only used in the fall at our northern Minnesota summer cottage. It, it really pinned a person to the bed. Hey, it was the, it was the forerunner to the weighted blanket. Did she know that she had an invention? That's the, I mean, that's what we do now. I put a uh, blanket over Teddy when he's acting like a banana, and it weighs about, well, I think it weighs 20 pounds. <laughs> but he feels comfortable under it, and he settles right down. I guess he can't move, so um, that's funny, Carrie. So then she goes on. I'm going to share again. She goes on to show you. She does a lot of this in this book. Um, who's that artist? Marjorie... Um, um, B A S T O, um, maybe a J in there. Do you know who I mean? Who does a lot of sketchbook stuff, greeting cards, um, novelty books. You know what I mean? This artist too, Mandy, does a lot in this book with showing sketchbooks um, that she's done. Pages of her sketchbooks that she's done. Let me come down here. Um, there. Nope. Oops. Wait a minute. Boop, 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 boop. Nope, that was serious. Um, uh oh, wait a minute. I'm doing some serious spoiler alerts here. I might have put the wrong thing in. Close your eyes. No, no. I guess my birds aren't there. All right, no more spoiler alerts. I'm going to come back to you and show you in person. I think I put the thing in under the wrong name. Sorry about that. It's a good disco. So she does this stuff. I bet we're going to stumble upon it. She will find, for example, look at the background of this close up because it looks to me again like she might have reversed something old and is using the back. 
it has such a parchmenty look because it's so damaged, right? It's terribly damaged. This could easily be the back or even the batting of something, the middle of the quilt. But she's, it, it's, she's either taken it apart or it's quite bad already. And what she's doing with it, come a little bit more in focus. What she's doing with it is she's, she's really taking a read in terms of atmosphere. It has a very bleak and wintry kind of feel, doesn't it? It's got a patchy uh, feel. And she's putting these little birds on it, which reminds me of sp like early spring or the birds out there in the winter by my mom's feeder. And she's really using the elements of decay, damage, decomposition that have happened naturally to this textile. She's using it to her advantage to create a scene that complements it. Because without these birds, it really does look like a bit of a landscape, right? It looks a bit rough. But now she drops in these birds, and here they are looking for food, looking for things to put in their nests, and she's done kind of a repeat pattern. So she's created a bird that she likes in her sketchbook. She's traced it onto cardboard, right? And she's, she's laying down for herself where she's going to add more birds. And she's pinning them down, and she's going to applique them on, means sewing them with as invisible a stitch as she can do uh, right around the bird and attaching it to the backing fabric. That's what applique is. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mom. Mar Marjolene Bastin, that's it. I had the wrong words and the wrong um, in the surname as opposed to the first name. That's funny. But yes, yeah, she, she's very much in the vein of this artist in terms of wildlife designing, little animals, um, and the sort of quality of the illustration too. Very watercolor driven, right? So I really like that, the idea of these tiny little quilt pieces being added and looking even closer I can see that she's actually just traced this right she's traced this shape under and you see she's just pinning bits of cloth onto it where she's going to attach it you know I would be really careful normally with applique what I would do in these moments of pinning little bits of cloth to something is normally I would first have put interfacing on them right just with a hit of an iron to attach them so they're a little bit the, the double-sided so that they're attached to each other but with this textile I would not and she has not I would not dare to touch an iron to this textile not because I think that the content is anything but 100% natural but because I don't think it can take any heat I don't think it can even take a glance with your eyes right it's like don't look at me I'm atomizing as we speak so you want to be so careful with these old textiles but you can see she's very carefully pinning and placing these things in place and once she gets these birds onto that backing it will stabilize everything right it'll give it more thickness it'll give it more integrity it will help the overall textile out oh is she a dutch artist oh i didn't know that interesting that that you know well, they, it's a very dutch name there we go So, and then she talks about, um, she has a page on deconstructing, helping you figure out how to break something down. So we do this with clothes, clothing. We've talked about this with sweaters and skirts and taking out the zippers and how you clean things to cut them into wool strips to rug hook with. Well, she's talking about different things like garments, like quilts, and how you're taking them apart to be able to put them back together again, right? In that case, she, she um, embroidered onto that red coat. But she gives you some very good practical advice, and she um, references a lot of other artists who are British artists who are doing similar work, particularly in the areas that she's talking about, right? So more on that in a minute, but it's really, really neat. Very different for us looking at these British books because these are, for the most part, very different names, very different ideas. Even though we are living at the same time in history and we have the internet, we tend to do very different work and we use different tools and we work in completely different ways, different techniques, right? Even with rug hooking, we work in completely parallel to each other. So it's interesting to look at books of what British artists are doing that have anything to do with textile art because there's a lot of cro there's more crossover than you think because they are a lot less fussy and persnickety about the tool that's in their hand. They are much more hands-on, figure it out as you go, um, which is a good approach when you are looking at any kind of rug making. Caroline said, glad to be. Oh, Caroline, are you home? I'm so glad. Caroline wrote, she was, you were in the hospital on Friday. I hope it's okay that I said that. And I'm very glad that you're home now. I'm very glad that you're home. Thank you for letting us know. So, you know what, let me come down to something completely different. Very Monty Python, let's see. 
Now, I'm probably going to mess this up again. Yep, look at me go. There we go. So this image that I'm looking at is from a part of the book that she refers to as book forms. So she, can, she does some pieces that are kind of um, a scroll, right, like a medieval scroll. And it looks like she's using a rolling pin. Now, isn't this a great idea? Isn't this a great idea? Two rolling pins together, and it would be like the town crier, wouldn't it? Hear ye, hear ye. Um, but even one, in terms of display, even hanging, or a gift, what a cool thing to give as a gift a scroll book like this that's attached to an old uh, rolling pin. And in it, I mean, it could be like a story that unfolds, one continuous story. Or if you're a person who likes to do the kind of quilting techniques like transferring photography onto cotton, including that like a rolling fabric scrapbook, what a beautiful textile themed gift to give to somebody. And with something like this, you could even um, on the back put hooking or punching or something a bit more durable, right, to make it very, very formidable. But I thought what a cool idea this is. Uh, hers just goes on and on and on. But um, yeah, I really liked this as an idea. So let me move forward and see what our next. So then she moves into, she does, there's a whole chapter on making books, right, out of old textiles. And I think that's just cool. If that appeals to you at all, you have got to see this. Actually, I've got to come back to you here because I just spotted, I just spotted Paisley. I just saw here, she made this little book. It's called A Book of Stars. Oh, and each page and cover are, um, this is measurement 12 by eight and a half. That's quite big. Um, it doesn't say, oh, it does say what's in the book. Oh my God, wait till you see this. I should have taken a photo of this, a book of stars. So she's actually got an old, she got hold of an old quilt with this star block pattern, right? So this is the cover and it's got patched paisley behind it and one star and the whole book is going to be the rest of the blocks. So what a nice way to pay tribute to something that she has either decomposed or I mean, I often, every time I go antiquing, I find a collection of quilt blocks that have been orphaned and are not put together yet. And what a great thing to do to put together a little book like that or a scroll, um, the Book of Stars. So all of the stars that she got a hold of are now contained in one place safely, and it's its own piece of art now. I think that is so sweet. Let's see, let's see what I got next for you. So this is what I've got next for you. I absolutely love this piece. Um, I, I can't. Wait a minute. I found something else I've got to show you. I'm having a heck of a time with my finger. Just switch to the Magdalena template. So I had to stop for a minute because there were a couple things I needed to show you in the meantime. She talks about quilt words because here's another one. Have you ever gone out and found um, a textile that has words on it or dates or whatever? Crazy quilts are big for this, aren't they? Um, so this is interesting because this one, um, this one says, Recule, 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 vu. So I think that means like um, uh, collect yourself, like get yourself together, like literally collect yourself, recule, vu. French speakers, can you help me with that? That's not an everyday, but it has text on it. Um, such great ideas, yeah, right? I mean, I, I, I just love this in terms of collage and composition too. You could just be looking at this book and coming up with composition ideas, but she pulled this aside because it had text on it and she added stuff to it. So she embroidered and layered more ideas onto it. And I think that's really cool. Saving the words that somebody wrote down, right? Saving them. And it's so mysterious to get words out of context too, and years. But instead of just trashing them and, and cutting them out because you can't use them or you can't hook with them, interesting to think about including them as part of a composition, right? Somebody else's words. Now, this is one of the coolest, this is one of the coolest things I've ever seen. I'm going to share with you again. Um, this is using words, but let me scroll up here. Ledger, this is the one. Let's look at this first. If you can see, I hope you can see this pretty well. This is an original piece that she did. And listen to the genesis of this piece. It is so beautiful. This, this is, piece is called Money Worries, right? And you can see that this is a textile collage that she has put together from old textiles and this is the background to it. She says the quilt artwork illustrated here is a very personal piece of work that uses extracts from my maternal grandmother's diaries. 
she was a farmer's wife and there was never much money around. The, di the diaries catalog her concerns with profit and loss and the price of things. At the back of the diary, there are numerous sums, which were usually her totals for egg sales that she made from the kitchen door and to her local shopkeepers. My grandmother's handwriting is very familiar to me, and so it seemed only right to try to capture that exactly. I did this by photocopying the diary entry and enlarging it slightly. I then placed the photocopy over a sheet of typewriter carbon paper and traced the words onto the quilt top. So she had already created the textile. She'd already created the composition the way she wanted it. And the, doing the words and the math is going to be the last piece. I had to press quite hard to get the marks to come through onto the coverlet. And you might find the same if your quilt top is very quilted and lumpy. Practice on a separate section first to see if it's going to work. If the lettering is not coming through, then it's because your carbon paper is not fresh or you need a flatter surface than a quilt. It could be just a piece of linen, for example. So she's giving you a lot of tips to do something like this, but I thought this idea of pulling a page called Money Worries uh, from her grandmother's diary was an absolutely beautiful and novel idea. Lisa says, I've bought an alphabet quilt I've bought alphabet quilt pieces that were unfinished from an antique store. They're currently in a tin awaiting a project. How cool is that? You know, I love the idea of that rolling pin book, I have to say. And it's like you could still display that. You could do the coolest thing with a scroll, like the sort of town crier scroll. Um, let me come back to you for a minute. And let me get rid of this guy first. Let's see. Get rid of Ledger. And I'm going to come back. Um, I love the idea of being able to display things that way because as rug hookers, I think we struggle a lot with how to display and get things up on the wall. Um, and once we've mastered that, it's like you, sometimes you're looking for the next way, something a bit more creative, so, uh, some new way to display your work. I just love those rolling pins. Okay, what if you even had rolling pin? Would it even be possible, this is maybe sketchy, to cut a rolling pin in half so you could get those parts flat on the wall because if the rolling pin were cut in half, and again, I don't know if this is even possible because of the central part, right? But if it was if it was somehow cut in half or you figured out how to at least cut part of it off, then you could put regular hanger on the back of the flat part and be sure that it would hang to the wall. And then your piece, right, your quilt pieces or your just multimedia collage piece, however long you wanted to make it, it could be like a transom over a door. If you've got a double door, like I've got big doors in between like the living room and dining room and the dining room and the kitchen, like, you know, big, 150 year old house, big double doors. Imagine a nice scrolling piece going across the top of a door like that or bell pull style, just the other way down, right? But neat, neat ideas. There's a lot in this book that really has me thinking. I've only gotten into the first few pages and I'm already really thinking. So finally, the Staffordshire dog. So you can see that these are based on, if you're familiar with uh, down at the bottom, there's like a little drawing of Staffordshire. Um, it's a screen print uh, by, by Alice Petulo. So that must be a family member of the Staffordshire dogs. Um, these are, you know, beautiful, very collectible um, statuettes that you see a lot in England, very common type of collection to have, and a very popular motif, maybe more in the UK than here, but I think recognizable to us. And you can see here that she's used the drawing of a family member, oh, her daughter, Alice. Alice, her daughter, is an illustrator, and I share a love for collecting from flea markets with her. For me, it's mostly textiles, uh, but both of us love folk art pottery and can't resist a china figure of a bird or if we can find them at a reasonable price a pair of traditionally called wally dogs okay so i guess they're calling these wally dogs i don't know that reference at all i wonder if you do i don't know that reference but um they look a bit like chintz right i'm thinking the morris chintz i can tell that they're staffordshire dogs but cool she created these little applique characters and you can see for backing she tipped a tumbling blocks quilt because the tumbling blocks always has the light side up like the video game Cubert. There I go, revealing my age, which you already know is about to be 50. But they've tipped the background quilt in this case, and I like it tipped because now it has this weird Escher step going down it and a pair of dogs. How cute is that? 
What is better than one Staffordshire dog, two Staffordshire dogs? Of course. Beverly says, you can put a rolling pin on a sander to make it flat. Oh, like a sander belt kind of. That's interesting because even if you could sand part of it down, it would sit against the wall better, wouldn't it? And then you've got your half of your town crier scroll ready to go. I like this. I really like this idea. Thanks, Beverly. That is, that is smart. I really like that. So let's see some of our other examples because she goes pretty far with the idea of the repeat dog on a tumbling block. So this is another product of that same idea. This is like a couple of Dalmatian dogs on a different part of the quilt. Now what a great idea, particularly if you have an old quilt or textile, tapestry, cross stitch, anything that really is, is done and you don't see yourself restoring it to the original state and you have been looking for a project where you could recreate it and reinvent, well, why not just cover up the really forlorn parts of it with a beautiful applique, right? Whether it's cotton, whether it's wool, we haven't come to the wool part of this book yet, uh, whatever it is, right? Because I don't think a textile like this could handle being punched through um, at all, even with like a miniature punch. I don't, I don't know, I would have to experiment to really find out. But doing an applique piece on top of it is a very good solution to something that has gaping whole osis, right? So just another example of a really, really nice composition, but this time with Dalmatians. And don't, don't feel left out, Penny and Kirsten. Uh, and for you cat lovers, right? Cats, right? This makes a lot of sense too. A couple of Staffordshire cats. So all on the same quilt, and now she's broken one quilt that probably was not in good shape at all. She's broken it down into three completely separate compositions. And I think that's really, really smart. So we're gonna return to this because the next chapter is going to be, I'll share one more image with you on the way out, and then I'll come back to you one more time. The next image she's, the next chapter she's looking, um, oops, wait a minute. Let me get rid of those. She's looking at, did I do that? My mother loves it when I say that. Nope, I don't have it here, so we're going to look at it tomorrow. Um, she's looking at stitching on crazy quilts and taking crazy quilts apart. So we'll look at that briefly tomorrow, but then I really want to run to, oh, you know what, tomorrow I have a doctor's appointment. So let's say Thursday. I'll be back on Thursday. That's not my usual day, but I have a doctor's appointment at 1130 tomorrow. Um, so on Thursday, I'll be back to you and we will conclude looking at this book. So remember that, right? Um, we're going to start looking at wool embroidery and here is a, here's a teaser. How great is this? We've looked, uh, m so many British books on design include patterns in original designs that are about an allotment, right? And I particularly love this piece of wool embroidery because the top is the allotment garden and the bottom seems to be a cemetery around a churchyard. I mean, does it get any better than this? This is so beautiful to me, right? Such telling a story here, to, this is, must be somebody's little town or whatever, the allotment garden, which is like the shared public garden where everybody gets a little square uh, with the church down at the bottom. So to, um, not tomorrow, but Thursday, we will come back to this great book called Textiles Transformed by Mandy Petullo. Um, and we'll look at the next section of the book, which is um, doing applique and mixed media uh, textile art with wool and wool embroidery. So that is a bit more of an um, easy translation to us as rug hookers, but I think in terms of composition, most of the things that we're talking about are things that you can see um, the idea is brilliant and you can borrow or run with your own version of the idea. It would be really good. Thank you, Linda. Thumbs up. Yes, please. Um, I hope I caught all those comments. It was great seeing you. I can't believe how fast our time goes. It's crazy, isn't it? Um, but in any case, I'm going to put this up um, later today. I might work on it for a few more minutes, but I think I better get back to orders in the book. But I'll put that up later for people who want to do that. It will be available as a kit or um, and or a class or a pattern, right? So that's coming up too. There are still some vintage, I think there's still some vintage tea sets out. Um, and I'm going to be doing another die set. Um, I'm going to bring out the Maud Lewis die uh, swatch set too. I'm going to work on that in the next 48 hours because I have an order for that and I cannot find where I put those. So I'm just going to do some more. Um, so I'll put out limited quality of those too if you're interested in having those. So check out what's going on as far as classes. Remember, I won't be with you tomorrow, but I will be with, with you on Thursday to conclude this book, Textiles Transformed. I will see you